Muito boa tarde a todos. Sejam bem-vindos a esta segunda sessão de debate do programa das Cordas das Conferências de Lisboa sobre o tema de, o dilema de desigualdade de crescimento. É um prazer uh, poder partilhar este momento convosco e com os uh, oradores convidados. Gostaria, e falo em inglês, uh, I would like to, to remind that there is simultaneous interpretation in, in the session uh, and the choice between Portuguese and English uh, may be done directly in the, in the platform. Regresso ao português, uh, iremos ter uma introdução, uh, esta introdução da apresentação em português, de seguida uh, darei a palavra para as intervenções principais dos participantes no, no debate, que o farão uh, a Catarina Pisper em inglês, o Francisco Ferreira em português, e depois no debate uh, utilizaremos provavelmente mais o inglês do que o português, mas a, a escolha uh, é livre quanto à língua uh, a utilizar. Permitam-me permitam que apresente os membros do painel. Em primeiro lugar, uh, uh, Catarina Pister, uh, um nome uh, subejamente conhecido, é professora da Columbia University, uh, diretora do Centro de Estudos Globais, uh, já foi professora em Harvard também, Uh, tem um, um dos livros mais desafiantes que uh, tive a oportunidade de ler recentemente, The Code of Capital, como é que a lei cria uh, riqueza e desigualdade. Uh, e temos uh, uh, também o, o, o Francisco Ferreira, uh, professor da Catra Amartya Sen uh, uh, em estudos da desigualdade na, na LSE, da London School of Economics, depois de uma uh, longa e muito bem sucedida carreira no Banco uh, Mundial, em que uh, dirigiu durante vários anos a Unidade de, de Pobreza e Desigualdade, que tem uma obra também uh, vasta uh, sobre... sobre uh, sobre essas matérias que hoje aqui nos, nos trazem e que hoje em dia, mais até do que noutros tempos, diria, tem uma relevância particular à luz da recente evolução pandémica que temos estado a viver e que continuaremos a viver. Gostaria de lembrar também a todos aqueles que estão a acompanhar este, este debate que podem colocar questões no Zoom, na secção Q&A, ou para quem está a acompanhar no YouTube, na secção de comentários, essas questões depois serão objeto de, de debate entre os membros do painel, depois das intervenções iniciais que cada um, cada um fará. Eu uh, terei depois a oportunidade de interagir com, com os membros do painel uh, e, e moderar o debate, coisa que faço com, com muito gosto e com, e com muito proveito. Ao longo da próxima hora teremos certamente muito uh, que podemos falar e muito que podemos e que vamos certamente aprender sobre este tema. Catarina Pister, may I give you the floor and ask you to to make your initial presentation. Thank you very much for being present. Well, thank you so much for having me and thank you for the very kind introduction. It's a really a great pleasure for me to talk to you today. I was actually hoping to come to Lisbon in May. I've never been to the city, but uh, maybe there will be, I hope there will be another opportunity, but I'm delighted to be here uh, today uh, via Zoom conferencing. Let me, um, tell you a little bit where I'm coming from and explain some of the core arguments that I did develop in the book, The Code of Capital that has been mentioned and that I also developed in an earlier paper on the legal theory of finance. So my core argument is that the source code for wealth creation is actually the law. The law being of course a public good, not a private good. It's a legal system that 
works by ensuring people, uh, holders of assets and interests and claims, that they can enforce a claim against others, right? So that is somewhat intuitive. We're saying um, the legal system is supposed to enforce property rights and contracts, assuming that people just enter into these arrangements and then all the law does is enforce whatever arrangements they make. What I'm arguing in the book is that actually the private law institutions that have been used for several centuries to code capital are much more malleable or flexible than is very often assumed, especially amongst economists, and that they can be used to basically create a hierarchy of rights, to create, create stronger rights versus weaker rights, to protect some interest over time while leaving others to deal with the fluctuation of business cycles or major crisis um, as uh, the one that we're currently living through. So what the legal system really does, it allows you to basically create um, a legal, um, uh, you can put your assets on legal steroids, as I say in the book, and let me just explain to you how this works. We are ranking assets. Somebody has a property right. Others might have a collateral interest. Others only have an unsecured interest. We are extending these rights over time. We make them durable, as I call this in the book, by ensuring that we can protect assets against too many claimants in the future and the common law trust or the corporate entity status, the legal person is a, a common device to do so. Um, we're also ensuring that this is critical that these arrangements are enforceable not only between the parties to that arrangement, but there are enforced against the world, erga omnis, um, which basically means that they're universally va valid, as, at least as long as far as a particular legal regime goes. And as I argue in the book as well, because we have conflict of law rules by which other states commit to enforce the private law arrangements of foreign states, they basically can extend to the globe as well, and, and they do. And then last but not least, and I think this is really critical for our current age and also for the COVID crisis, we have what, I, what we call convertibility, which means that asset holders, especially asset holders of financial assets, can attain the durability of the wealth that they have already created in the past, by flipping them, by converting them into safer assets, ideally into cash. So the only financial asset that does not lose its nominal value, nominal value in a crisis is state issued legal tender, all privately issued financial assets can use, uh, can lose their value in a financial crisis. And so this is really important to think about when we come, um, when we're thinking about the impact of the COVID crisis. So the general point I want to make is that the law can be used to create structural inequalities. And that's the purpose of private law is to create stronger and weaker rights. But we also have to understand that, of course, we are making, we're creating these rights typically under conditions of great uncertainty. So we don't really know how this pans out in the future. The parties with the better bargaining powers will try to use the legal devices with the help of sophisticated lawyers who might call the masters of the code. They're trying to shift the risk of dealing with future uncertainty to the other side, typically to the weaker side. So our, our entire economic system and our entire financial system is coded in law, in legal arrangements. And in order to scale these systems to size, we have made these um, commitments rather rigid, right? We want to have credible commitments as economists would say, so that we can enforce them at a future date, or we don't even have to enforce them because people trust that they would be enforceable and so that they work. But when rigid legal commitments to live up to them meet crises, meet the manifestation of future uncertainties, then we actually um, see how deeply hierarchical the system is in which we live. Um, because, of course, a system that is coded in credible, rigid legal commitment, when the world changes after these commitments were made, the system can self-destroy. Because when everybody enforces their legal commitment at the same time, when the circumstances has changed radically, there will not be enough money to go around. Too many people will go bankrupt, bringing others down with them. This is very apparent in the financial system. We've seen this exactly play out in the 2008 financial crisis. 
we have created far too many enforceable legal commitment on a flimsy base on the assumption that housing prices would go, um, go up forever. That has created wealth and some equality for some time, but when the system crashed, the question is, how do we actually avoid the full um, self-destruction of the system? And in times of crisis, you see very often the state intervene in different disguise. One disguise, of course, are the central banks. And in 2008, and again this year in 2020, they intervened to basically put a floor underneath the losses that private asset, asset holders might experience by offering liquidity where no liquidity was legally owed. Um, they did not only offer liquidity to the banks that paid basically in terms of regulatory cost to the central bank to have access to it, but they also um, relaxed or suspended the legal rules of the game for other players in financial markets. Think about money market funds, think about eventually also mortgages. So it went down, but it really starts at the top typically. So the central bank tries to rescue the system from self-destruction by suspending or at least relaxing the full force of the legal commitment that the parties have made ex ante to build the system to size. Systems are scalable only on the basis of these credible commitment. Let's move on to the COVID crisis. What have we seen here? So the COVID crisis has ex uh, um, exposed everybody, um, asset holders and financial markets, but also simple households to the problem of dealing with rigid legal commitments that they have made in the past, if only to rent a home or to pay a mortgage with flexibility sometimes on the part of an employer, especially in this country, but um, in other countries as well, if you can just fire people, then your cash flow might be diminished or go to zero tomorrow while you still have legal commitments to fulfill. And that puts everybody in a pinch. So the mechanisms that we use to scale systems actually also to deal with problems of inequality by making sure that even poorer people have access to the legal system to make credible commitments to give a mortgage to pledge their property in order to have access to credit credit when the system crashes when there is an exogenous shock like we've seen in COVID, we can also see who actually are the ones who are most caught in the problem of having to deal with rigid commitments which they cannot suspend themselves. So one possibility, of course, is that people anticipate the possibility of future uncertainty and they will include some provisions in their contracts to deal with this, to address that. Um, force majeure pro provisions are relatively common, but force majeure provisions um, uh, don't all, always necessarily cover a pandemic and they're not in all contracts, right? You have to have a sophisticated lawyer on your side to make sure that you can Put this um, in. So um, uh, most many people actually, you know, basically felt the pinch. And of course, governments intervened to some extent, basically by saying we are putting a moratorium on ev evictions, or we are paying the wages for employees of private companies as well to make sure that they have an income. But most of the interventions for people at the lower income level are temporary and are also constrained by the ability of states to sustain these payments, which in turn are of course constrained by the monetary regimes that they have adopted, whether they have their own currency or not, can do monetary financing or not, by state aid rules in, in, in the European Union, by political issues, of course. And you see that play out um, in the US Congress right now and in other parts of the world as well. At the top of the system, um, of the financial system, that's basically where, where the core operates and where we've seen in 2008, it's the core that is being protected against self-destruction. We've seen the, the central banks intervene once more and offer liquidity um, and support on a scale that was really unprecedented. The speed was unprecedented in, in March. It was very effective, but I think what is critical to understand the uh, degree of structural inequality in our in our system is we have to compare the interventions that we make for those at the bottom and those at the top mm -hmm. and those at the top were much more uh, flexible they remain open-ended because the central banks are basically standing by to offer additional support if needed they're tinkering with their collateral guidelines they're offering liquidity support they're buying assets that they have never bought before 
Whereas at the bottom of the system, we're basically um, um, using more than we did in 2008 for sure, but we're basically using mostly temporal measures and no structural measures. And so my prediction for the longer um, uh, view of how we end up after COVID is that actually the structural inequalities will be much deeper uh, because many people at the bottom basically will be caught in the spiral of commitments they have made, but under very different um, circumstances. And if we do not adjust them or find ways to support these folks, they, um, they will um, face economic um, hardship um, on, on a very large scale in many, many countries. Whereas on the top, we've seen this, the stock prices reflect this. Most people are much less concerned because they know that they have the Federal Reserve um, at their hand. So just stepping back again, um, what I'm arguing here is that we are having a legal code that um, helps not only in the coding of assets, which is mostly an exercise that is done in the private law offices of well-paid law firms in the major legal and financial centers of the world, of which London and New York are still the leading, but there are many others as well. That is really important because they can use the law and harness and fashion new types of financial assets. And what is even more interesting is that many of these assets, the financial assets that they can create out of the law also typically um, get greater support in times of crisis from central banks because the fear is that the financial markets might crash. Um, whereas others who have much less access to lawyers who might not even have the benefit of, of limited liability but exposed with their own personal assets such as they are, will face the rigidity of the law and at most get a temporal um, relief. So maybe let me just leave it here for now, just to see um, that we can have some time later on for, for discussion. Um, I hope I could convey sort of the basic argument that I'm trying to make here. And I'm really curious to see how this pans out when we look at the data, which I think is the core topic of the next uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Katerina, for your very interesting and very stimulating uh, intervention. We will debate on some of, uh, of the assertions you, you've made. I now give the floor to Francisco Ferreira for uh, his uh, initial intervention. Ok, bom, boa tarde a todos. É um prazer estar aqui presente. Se bem que, como a Catarina, eu, obviamente, preferiria poder estar em Lisboa. Eu já tive o prazer de conhecer a cidade, que é uma linda cidade. Adoraria poder é, estar aí com vocês, mas é, é, gostaria, de qualquer maneira, de fazer uma pequena intervenção aqui. É, o que eu pensei fazer é, era fazer um breve panorama das tendências da desigualdade nos últimos 25 a 30 anos. É, pelo mundo afora, ainda que nós depois nos aprofundemos em alguns países, e eu, eu chamo essa história de uma história de dois hemisférios por razões que ficaram claras. Como nós estamos falando de crescimento, é, eu achei importante também falar um pouquinho sobre a pobreza, só para dar um, um, um contexto geral sobre isso. Né? A pobreza global, mundial, como medida pelo Banco Mundial, que é o número ou a proporção de pessoas vivendo com uma renda inferior a 1,90 dólar por dia, é, caiu muito nesse período, né? de 1990 a 2015. Em 1990, nós estimamos que havia 1,9 bilhão de pessoas vivendo nessa situação de extrema pobreza, mais de um terço né, da população mundial. E isso caiu até 2015 para 10%, ou 736 é, milhões de pessoas, quer dizer, ainda que tenha havido um grande crescimento populacional, não só a fração, mas também o número absoluto de pessoas vivendo em pobreza caiu. E essa queda, na verdade, é robusta a outra, ao uso de outras linhas de pobreza, que eu não mostro aqui, mas para qualquer linha entre 1 e 15 dólares por dia é, haveria essa queda. Né? Então, é, é um sistema é, que pode não ter feito muitas outras coisas, mas contribuiu com a globalização, o crescimento da China, da Índia e de outros países, a uma redução na pobreza absoluta no mundo. Mas e a desigualdade? Né? Bom, a desigualdade... É... Também há boas notícias no que se refere à desigualdade, pelo menos a desigualdade global, é, é... que é medida, em geral, em termos da desigualdade entre indivíduos, né? é... onde cada indivíduo tem o mesmo peso, 
e tem a sua própria renda. Então, uma desigualdade sem fronteiras, a desigualdade global, como definida pelo François Bourguignon ou pelo Branco Milanovic. Né? E o que se vê aqui, por exemplo, o trabalho de François Bourguignon, nesse livro de 2015, né? havia um crescimento secular dessa desigualdade mundial. Até por volta de 1990, essa quebra aqui é simplesmente estatística devido à mudança nas, nas taxas de câmbio de paridade de poder de compra nesse momento, mas aí, então, passa a haver uma queda. Né? Há diferentes métodos usados aqui ou pelo branco, então essa queda é mais acentuada no caso do François, mas mesmo no caso do que o branco Milanovic faz com o Christoph Lachner, há uma queda também, seja pelo coeficiente de Gini, seja pelo desvio logarítmico médio, há uma queda que se vê na desigualdade global entre é, por volta de 1990 e até a metade da década passada. Né? É, essa medida é, ela pode ser decomposta entre desigualdade dentro de países e desigualdade entre países. Né? Isso talvez seja bem conhecido desse público, que, essa, que a maior parte da desigualdade global é uma desigualdade entre países, mas que é essa parte a que mais caiu. Né? Ela é que causa a redução. Isso tem a ver com a convergência o crescimento da China, da Índia, partes da África, outros países. Mas e a desigualdade dentro de cada país, que talvez seja a que mais preocupa, né? a que preocupa, por exemplo, o Thomas Piketty, o Emmanuel Salles e muitos de nós. Né? Bom, aí é interessante, talvez seja um pouco mais surpreendente até, nós temos um trabalho ainda, ainda em andamento, com o Chris, meu, com o Christoph Lachner e o uh, Annie Silwell, onde nós olhamos mais de 100 países, né? É, ao longo do tempo, de diferentes maneiras. Esses gráficos aqui, é, os azuis, os países não são ponderados, é uma, reda, é uma média entre países. Nos vermelhos, é, leva-se em conta o peso na população, que eles são ponderados pela população. E a gente pode olhar todos os países para os quais nós temos dados em cada ano ou olhar somente o conjunto de países para os quais nós temos dados ao longo de todo o período, que se chama um painel equilibrado. Seja como for, a partir de 1995, a desigualdade entre países, ponderada ou não, deixa de crescer. Em alguns casos, ela até cai. Na verdade, em todos os casos, ela cai a partir de 2010. Mas vamos dizer só que ela parou de crescer. Tá certo? Isso pode parecer surpreendente, né? não é a narrativa que a gente escuta em geral, a narrativa que a gente escuta é de desigualdade crescendo em todos os lugares. Né? Então, aqui a gente olha, por exemplo, eu mostro alguns países que nós temos dados entre 90 e 2015, né? as 62 desses países. De fato, as duas coisas ocorrem. Né? Aqui, nesse período, a maior parte dos países, a desigualdade sobe, 32 deles. Mas, em 23, ela cai. Né? E o ponto aqui dos meus retângulos vermelhos e verdes é a mostrar essa convergência hemisférica e a minha história de dois hemisférios. Você vê que os países industrializados, entre os quais Portugal, mas também os Estados Unidos, a Inglaterra, a França, os países onde moram os economistas que você lê, né? os países onde moram os economistas que você lê e onde eles escrevem, de fato, a desigualdade aumentou em quase todos, assim como na Europa Oriental né? e na Ásia Central. Mas na América Latina, partes da África, partes do Oriente Médio, a desigualdade cai, né? cai em 21 países e aumenta em seis, por exemplo. Né? E eu não tenho tempo agora para me deter nos detalhes, mas a gente pode depois no debate até comparar isso com os dados da UID, né? de, de, do, do grupo do, do Piketty em Paris. É, surpreendentemente, não há muita divergência para os países que temos em comum nas duas bases. O que há uma divergência é na cobertura dos países. Né? A cobertura do UID é principalmente nesses retângulos vermelhos, né? enquanto que nós temos uma cobertura maior. Então, eu agora gostaria de passar um pouquinho de tempo falando rapidamente sobre o que eu considero, com base na literatura, os determinantes dessas duas tendências, do aumento da desigualdade no hemisfério norte e da redução da desigualdade no hemisfério sul. Claro que eu estou simplificando muito, né? note-se que não é, não é igual em todos os hemisférios, mas há uma tendência de aumento da desigualdade nos países ricos e uma tendência de queda nos países pobres. Começando pelos países ricos, eu gostaria de enfatizar três fatores, e para cada um deles eu tenho alguns gráficos, né, em geral de outros autores. 
Então, aqui, por exemplo, primeira coisa, o progresso tecnológico né, viesado, do qual falam os economistas, a questão do, do efeito dos computadores e da automação, né, que tem levado a uma polarização ocupacional. Então, o, o artigo clássico disso é o Arthur Levy Murnay, no, no, no Quarterly Journal of Economics. Eles ordenam as ocupações daquelas que têm salário mais baixo, as que têm salário mais alto, e mostram aqui mudanças na função de densidade para diferentes tipos de trabalhos. Trabalhos, por exemplo, com tarefas rotineiras, se deslocam daqui, na distribuição, para cá, ou seja, caem na distribuição, aumenta a massa deles na parte de baixo da distribuição. Trabalhos com tarefas não rotineiras, mais interativos, têm a trajetória oposta, o peso delas na parte de baixo da distribuição cai e elas se deslocam para a parte superior da distribuição, levando, assim, a uma polarização ocupacional, da qual se fala muito esse trabalho, foi reproduzido em vários outros países. Não ocorre em todos, mas tende a ocorrer no hemisfério norte. Então, uma coisa, progresso tecnológico. Outra coisa, eu chamo aqui a derrocada da competição, e, e esse slide talvez seja o que se aproxima mais da apresentação da Catarina. Né? Acho que nós todos ouvimos falar já da queda na fração da renda total que vai para o trabalho, né? a famosa labor share. Né? Labor share é a fração da renda total de um país apropriado pelo trabalho, ela tem caído. E por muito tempo se disse, né? isso significa que a, a fração do capital tem aumentado. Eu gosto muito desse trabalho que acaba de ser publicado esse ano pelo Simcha Barakai, onde ele mostra que, na verdade, a remuneração do capital com base nas taxas de, de juros, que são bastante baixas, a remuneração do capital em termos da taxa de retorno requerida para remunerá-lo também cai. O que, é que tem aumentado, na verdade, é o que os economistas chamam de lucro puro ou lucro econômico, quer dizer, o retorno ao poder de mercado, o retorno ao poder de monopólio ou oligopólio. Né? seja nos setores mais avançados, nós todos podemos pensar na Apple, na Amazon, na Google, mas em outros setores também. Então, isso sobe de menos de zero até quase 10% da renda total nos Estados Unidos. Né? Então, isso obviamente tem a ver com regulação, com legislação, coisas das quais, uh, coisas que a, que a Catarina mencionou, né? que permitiram esse aumento no poder de mercado desses países. Né? Esse é o segundo fator. O último é também um fator de política, né? que é a dramática redução na progressividade da tributação. Esse gráfico, eu não sei se se vê bem, é, na verdade, é, vem de um artigo do New York Times, mas que reproduz um trabalho do Emmanuel Sais e do Gabriel Zuckman, onde eles mostram que a, a progressividade da tributação né, até 1950 era muito alta. Aqui nós temos os, o, o último percentil da distribuição, o famoso 1%, e aqui 0,01%, e aqui os 400 mais ricos nos Estados Unidos. E o que se vê é que, de 1950 a 2018, a tributação dessa parte da distribuição cai brutalmente. Então, você tem fatores de mercado, como é, o progresso tecnológico, você tem fatores de concentração de poder de mercado, que tem a ver tanto com é, é, mercado como com a regulamentação desse mercado pelo Estado ou a falta de regulamentação desse mercado pelo Estado e você tem tributação. Nos países mais pobres, né, é, do outro lado, onde a desigualdade tem caído, há uma série de fatores, né, obviamente aqui com o tempo que me resta não dá para falar muito, mas falando somente do caso do Brasil, que eu conheço melhor, né, eu enfatizaria dois fatores. No Brasil, mas também em vários outros países da América Latina, houve uma grande expansão educacional, como a que ocorreu nos Estados Unidos um século antes. Né? E essa expansão educacional levou a uma redução no retorno à educação. Há também uma grande redução no retorno à experiência, que talvez tenha a ver com o que eu chamo aqui de age bias technical change. O fato é que trabalhadores mais velhos e mais educados comandam um prêmio e esse prêmio caiu, e caiu em vários países. Além disso, há o que eu chamo de uma revolução silenciosa na proteção social. As transferências para os mais pobres, que são comuns na Europa e eram incomuns pelo mundo em desenvolvimento, têm se expandido. Ainda falta muito, mas têm se expandido e nós podemos, talvez, depois no debate, voltar a esse tema. Antes de terminar, eu já vou terminar, mas antes de terminar eu queria falar também, como nos foi pedido pelos organizadores, um pouquinho sobre o efeito da pandemia é, sobre essa desigualdade. E aqui eu gostaria de fazer quatro pontos. Primeiro, 
a própria pandemia, a doença, as taxas de infecção e mortalidade são elas próprias desigualmente distribuídas. Nos Estados Unidos e no Brasil há trabalhos que já mostram que elas são mais prevalentes entre os negros do que entre os brancos. Uh, além disso, elas são mais prevalentes nos países em desenvolvimento entre aqueles que moram em favelas ou outras moradias irregulares, onde há menos acesso à água, ao saneamento, e, de forma geral, aos trabalhadores mais pobres que não podem trabalhar de suas casas, assim como eu estou trabalhando hoje e a maioria de vocês. Aqueles que não podem fazer isso estão mais expostos. Né? Além dessa desigualdade da própria doença, criam-se novas desigualdades no mercado de trabalho, entre ocupações, de novo, principalmente entre aquelas que podem ter acesso ao trabalho remoto e a conectividade necessária para o trabalho remoto, e aquelas que não podem. E essas tendem a exacerbar desigualdades pré-existentes. Um terceiro ponto, há, eu acho uma coisa que está começando a ser discutido, mas, mas talvez ainda muito pouco, vai ser o efeito de longo prazo da desigualdade criada pelas diferenças na, nos fechamentos de escola e, nos, e nas maneiras como as escolas têm feito é, ensino remoto, que tendem a variar em qualidade entre mais pobres e mais ricos, vai ter um efeito sobre evasão é, e vai ter um efeito sobre aprendizado. Por outro lado, e esse ponto é um ponto que eu gostaria de enfatizar, é possível que as respostas políticas afetem, sim, e reduzam e aliviem é, os efeitos de curto prazo. Isso aconteceu no Brasil, aonde de fato, cresce hoje que a pobreza caiu nos últimos seis meses, por causa de uma intervenção, de um benefício que foi dado para todos os mais pobres para mitigar o efeito. É um, é um país extremo nesse caso. Apesar de ter extrema desigualdade, teve um extrem, uma extremamente bem-sucedida resposta política. Aqui um, um gráfico de um trabalho de dois colegas argentinos que ilustram as duas coisas. A desigualdade, o aumento na pobreza e na desigualdade, isso aqui é sem transferências, né? a perda é muito menor entre os mais ricos do que ela é entre os mais pobres, mas ela pode ser aliviada com transferência. E no meu último minutinho, 30 segundos que me restam, só para concluir alguns pontos. Né? Primeiro, o, o modelo de crescimento globalizado do, século, do último século XX, século XXI, talvez, surpreendentemente, foi bom para reduções de pobreza global e da desigualdade global. Nos Estados Unidos, de novo, onde moram os economistas que você lê, foi um período de estagnação mas para a China, para a Índia, para vários outros países, foi um período de crescimento e de convergência. Dentro dos países, a desigualdade, sim, cresceu em muitos lugares. De novo, nos Estados Unidos, na Inglaterra, por um longo período, na Suécia, mas não em todos. Por exemplo, na França não, não, não subiu. Mas caiu em muitos outros, por exemplo, na América Latina. Como eu resumi, os determinantes desse crescimento da desigualdade nos países ricos, polarização ocupacional, o aumento do poder do mercado e a derrocada da competição, declínio é, do, da tributação progressiva, o que indica né, que políticas podem evitar esse crescimento da desigualdade, ou seja, a desigualdade é uma escolha. Né? E, por fim, é, se é, não houverem políticas destinadas a compensá-la e a aliviá-la, a pandemia vai fazer as coisas piores, tornar as coisas piores, e talvez muito piores, e por muito tempo. E, e com isso, eu concluo. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado, Francisco. Excelente contributo para, para o nosso painel. Uma abordagem diferente de, de, de muitas das abordagens que conhecemos, bem detalhada. É um excelente estímulo para, para, para o debate e eu não queria deixar de incentivar uh, todos os participantes e todos aqueles que estão a assistir a este, a este, a este painel que coloquem as uh, suas questões. Eu, eu tenho já aqui uma questão uh, uh, de um dos participantes. Uh, I will now turn into English. Uh, I, I, I already have a, one question by one of the participants in our, in our conference. Uh, That you would like to, to have your views, uh, both Catherine and Francisco views, on, on the recent book of uh, Asemoglu and Robinson. Uh, and 
the different or the new approach on the wealth and the poverty uh, of nation. Um, would you like to, to share your views uh, with us? Well, I have Katerina, a little, please. yes, um, you know, I have great respect for these authors and, and read a lot of their work. Um, I think that in my, from my perspective, they um, have too glossy a view of what the law does and how the law plays into political liberalism and, um, and, 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 and democracy. So I think what they're missing from my perspective is the extent to which private parties can actually harness the powers of the law and use them for their own, own interest and use them against other private parties. So there is a power dynamic going on that we have hidden very often our discourse because we pretend that private parties just use the law as is and then enforce it against one another without recognizing that some have better access to the law to use it to advance their own specific interest against everybody else. And that's happening both domestically and, and, and globally. So as much as I give them credit and I think um, Darren Ajumobel and Robinson and others have really brought um, the study of institutions, also the empirical study of institutions to the forefront over the last decade or so. I think that they don't really understand the internal dynamics of, of, of law sufficiently and therefore I, I'm not quite on board with the generalization that they draw from their own analysis. Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure Katharina is uh, is, is right. Uh, I, I, I tend to like this idea of the narrow corridor, right? The, this idea that they have in this, in this last book of, um, you know, the state can be too weak, in which case predation from individuals uh, just, just takes over and there are no incentives to accumulate. I'm simplifying here with what's already a simplification. Uh, and the state being too strong, in which case the bandits are the state themselves and they uh, extract from uh, people. So there has, to be, there has to be this narrow corridor of institutional development in which, um, in which uh, rules and regulations are provided to guide the, the investment uh, of, of the private sector um, without, uh, without closing it down and suffocating it. Um, I, I think Katarina is, is quite right that, that, it, that, it, that you know, there are very sophisticated forms of state capture. Uh, I think economists have been talking about state capture for a while, but we tend to think of state capture as you know, local elites controlling local meetings. Uh, state capture can happen through the law, um, as, as I think Katarina's book has, has very nicely illustrated. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I personally feel that there is something to this idea of the narrow corridor. It was, uh, it was appealing to me when I, when I read it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your enlightening um, answers. Uh, let me uh, let let me bring a matter for for discussion. Um, I, I was particularly impressed by um, the the different approach. Uh, although at the end of the day. Um, I guess that both Katerina and Francisco are talking about the same, but looking into it uh, from different perspectives. Uh, um, the problem apparently on, on, on the creation of inequality, uh, the problem is, is not anymore as it was in the past by a, a, a greater uh, uh, capital appropriation, but but more in terms of uh, uh, increase of, uh, of market power and, and, and profit sharing. Um, uh, and Francisco uh, stressed that there is some sort of, of dismissive of competition, um, and, and and in itself it. It contributes for uh, for for greater inequality, but competition was uh, always presented as a way to make more efficient uh, economy, and therefore uh, creation of more wealth and and 
creating conditions for uh, for a, a better a better ways of living for uh, for, for everyone. Is it more a problem of law uh, or a problem of regulation? Uh, although I understand that law has in itself uh, some capabilities to to interfere in the game of distribution uh, uh, of wealth, uh, but it's not more the, the 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 failure, the state failure, and the state of the regulator in terms of level the playing field. What is your, 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 your views on these? Francesca, do you want to go first? I, I can try, um, but, but I, I'm really curious as to what you're going to say, Katrina, because I think you obviously you know the way the law works and regulations work a lot better than, than, than I do. I mean, what I was, I think the um, intellectual antecedent to, to what's going on here is Schumpeter. You know, Joseph Schumpeter used to talk in, in Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy, he used to talk about how, you know, a bit like Marx said, capitalism contains the seed of its own destruction. But Schumpeter thought it contained the seeds of its own destruction through a very different way, which was that companies would strive to compete and grow and grow and grow. And when they grew enough, they would become so powerful that they would become monopolies and they would be, you know, no longer in competition. And that would be the end of, of, of capitalism. Now, I'm not saying... We see exactly that now, but I think you know it, it, it's uh, just to stay with uh, with the, the the big examples of, of say um, Google um, or, or or Apple or Amazon. You can see an element in which the network externalities that arise from from uh, say search engines. Uh, suggests that maybe there is a sort of tendency towards a natural monopoly um, and that there is something about everybody going to look in the same place, just like markets used to happen in the same place in a village and not in different squares in the village. Um, nonetheless, that does generate enormous concentration of market power and of political influence, which is a timely thing to reflect on a few weeks before the uh, US presidential election. Um, so, uh, so yes, I, I, I do think, I mean, I was very struck by the numbers in this one paper that I mentioned, which suggests, but there are other papers by, um, you know, Jan de Locker and Jan Eichhout and others who've been suggesting the same thing. Uh, people have been writing about the, the superstar, the rise of the superstar firms. Uh, and, and, and what that is, is, uh, you know, yeah, growing, growing concentration of market power being an important part of, of, of the inequality. What the response uh, can be and should be, you know, I, I think I'll defer to Katerina on, but just to echo some of the things she said, I think it matters enormously that these companies will have tremendously good lawyers that are able to use uh, the law and, and, and regulations and fight, for example, the European Commission, right? The European Commission had a massive case against uh, some of these people and, and, and they lost. Uh, so I, I'll stop there and, and I'll interested to hear Katerina's view, I think. Yeah, I think it's it's really interesting to look at sort of what the role of law has to be in, for example, making sure that we have a competitive market. There's a reason that the Sherman Act was enacted in 1890 in the United States to combat the big, big trust companies. But you can also then see how from the very date of the enactment, um, lawyers and their clients were finding ways to get around it. So the first move after the Sherman Act, the antitrust law came down, was for a state, New Jersey, to allow corporations to hold shares in other corporations so that the trust companies could incorporate in New Jersey and basically internalize the market through a holding company rather than being subjected to the antitrust regime. And then you can just trace this through the century. My, my colleague, now colleague Lina Khan, who has um, written as a student still a really good article about um, Amazon and antitrust, the Amazon antitrust paradox, and worked for the Democratic Party on antitrust issues. She's just joined our faculty. She has shown how the legal doctrines that used, were used in the past to go after major corporations have been gutted by legal academics, by the Department of Justice, by the Federal Trade Commission to facilitate the rise of big 
firms and so they're trying to turn this around in terms of of, um, of just legal 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 doctrine so I, I think you know there's a tendency of markets to try to gain control and to make the world predictable that's what every firm wants to do sometimes they call it legal certainty and other times they call it um, something else um, and that basically um, means that um, the the state has to be vigilant to actually make sure that we have a competitive market so that the Schumpeter structure can play itself out and I think we've seen a couple of things um, in the past where, where exactly the, 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 the opposite has happened. It's the combination of no enforcement and antitrust, it's the deregulation, it's a facilitation of major firms such as um, Google or um, Facebook to have dual share structures and still be listed on major stock exchanges. We have relaxed all these rules so that you have a situation where Mark Zuckerberg controls 50, 57% of the voting power of Facebook and um, uh, and and faces antitrust issues and so so you could just add this up and you get a structure for how they've used different parts of the legal system domestically and globally to entrench um, their control. If I if I could just add very briefly, Luis 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 uh, Pais, just just very briefly yeah, to that, yeah. you know, in some sense, um, you know, I think I think economists, so many economists have for a long time pointed out, and political scientists that. Uh, you know, economic power and political power go together. It's a very simple statement. Um, and we tend to think of it as taking place in the electoral arena and in lobbying. But I think the point Catherine is making is that it also takes place in the law. Um, ec economic power can exert political power through changing the written code. Uh, and that is just another way in which that combination works, which is why, you know, why inequality uh, at its high levels becomes a threat to democracy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, the, the, that's, the, that's for sure. Um, although I think that the, the role of legislators and regulators is the, is the main role in this, uh, in this play, uh, because it is true that uh, uh, the way things are being shaped uh, create the conditions uh, and and improve the conditions for for taking better uh, uh, for taking benefit of the uh, of those opportunities. I, uh, I I have some more questions I would like to to, to share uh, with you. Um, well, somehow uh, and this is clearly linked with the the, the current pandemic situation of COVID nineteen. Um, we we were uh, uh, in a in an accelerated globalization uh, in the last decades. Um, is there a, uh, and of course this globalization, although as Francisco mentioned it, uh, did not have a, a, a negative impact in itself in, in terms of uh, inequality. Um, but it, it contributed uh, for a more visible uh, impact uh, uh, of the different situation in, uh, in each country. Um, is, is there any, any connection of, uh, of the outcome, uh, the, the way and the success and the speed on which we will put an end to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, is there any connection with the, a change on our current economic system? Uh, or shall we consider that uh, uh, there is no more room for the globalization method uh, we have experienced in the, in the last decade? What is your view on, on, on this? Katerina, um, please. Uh, I mean, I would, I would hope that we can strike a better balance um, because one of the you know, core features of globalization has been the ability for private parties to pick and choose the laws by which they wish to be governed, right? I can incorporate my corporation in Delaware or in the Cayman Island or in Cyprus or in Luxembourg or Netherlands and can still do business in the US or Germany or France or Portugal and will be recognized as a corporation. Um, I can shift my assets to these different accounts and I will be recognized. I can use private arbitration and can still use the courts of many countries to enforce the rulings that I get from a private arbitral tribunal. 
So we basically have leased out the state capacity to enforce um, um, the law um, and are basically just renting it out for a fee rather than shaping the norms under which this shall be um, enforced. And I think some of these choice options have gone too far because they are a direct challenge to democracies because democracies are still bound by polities, right? We have a, we, we, we're electing the US president only the United States, even if the world is affected by that, but we're still doing this in, in, in the United States and so, and the same in Portugal. And so the extent to which then private parties can simply shift out of that system and find another one, still do business at home is something that creates a tension that I think has to be addressed. And I think the flexibility with which private parties have been able to use the law that most benefits themselves, regulatory law by shifting to different countries and really physically outsourcing, but simply choosing the law without changing anything physically has created advantages for some and disadvantages for others that, that, that will have to be addressed. So I'm not saying no globalization at all, but I'm saying the blank check that we've given private parties with the guarantee that the legal system will still stand behind them and force them is has given away too much. And I would hope that we would reconsider this in the future. Yeah, so this relationship between globalization and inequality is complex. And, and what I was trying to say in my presentation is that I think there is evidence that globalization understood as large volumes of trade, uh, movements of capital and movements of people and movements of idea has helped reduce global inequality. But I'm not saying it has helped reduce inequality everywhere. In fact, there is good evidence that it has contributed to an increase in inequality in places like the United States. Uh, the evidence is mixed because, you know, China, goods from China uh, tended to be cheaper. And so they benefited many poor people who could go to Walmart and buy cheaper consumer goods. But there is evidence, again, from a person I quoted earlier, David Altor, with two other co-authors, Dorn and Hansen, and many others, that local labor markets, which competed directly with Chinese goods, saw big reductions in employment and wages. So sadly, there is some truth to the image of workers in poor and rich countries competing with each other. Now, the sum total is greater, right? Uh, there, is, there are still gains from trade, but they don't distribute themselves automatically. So part of the lack of a better balance that Katarina was talking about, in my view, comes from the fact that we failed to compensate the losers. I know a lot of those workers in the Midwest, in the American Midwest, that you saw supporting Trump in the, in the, in four years ago, uh, are people who did lose from trade with China. And the Democratic Party failed to even countenance the possibility that this was happening. Uh, you know, they were a victim of a doctrine of that free trade was always good. Now, I happen to, to know as a development economist, trade is great. It, without trade, you would not have seen that reduction in poverty because of the Chinas and Indians that benefited from trade. But you have to keep your people happy in the rich countries. And there are ways of doing that which were not used. So part of the better balance for a newer globalization would be systems of redistribution that ensure that the gains from trade are not obtained in the rich countries at the expense of some of the most vulnerable people in those countries. And just to end there, you know, the, the question was linked also to COVID. COVID, of course, now is the biggest threat to globalization as we experience it. You know, just today, uh, there was uh, something on the radio about uh, United Airlines and American Airlines have furloughed more than 30,000 workers. Uh, the, that, that's globalization in retreat right there. People are not flying anymore. But before that came, you know, globalization was already coming to a halt. And it was coming to a halt because of right-wing populism, uh, not only in the United States, also in Britain and, and you know, attempts at it in France and, and Germany that failed, but successful uh, attempts in, in the Philippines and Brazil and so on, um, who are basically electorally exploiting those people who were who the system allowed to lose uh, and ex exploiting them in a way that's very sad because you know they could have been made to gain um, but now now there's a whole ideology around uh, you know now no one competing in the elections in the United States can say we'd like to trade more with China um, 
Yeah, that, that's that, that's true. But we are approaching the 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 end of our of our panel. We have four four minutes left, and I would like to 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 give you the the opportunity to to make a, a closing address uh, to all the participants. And the, but I, I would like prior to that to 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 present you a challenge. Uh, what would be your main advice for this difficult balance uh, between excess of wealth and excess of poverty? What is the key um, to tackle with this difficult balance? Uh, Francisco first and Katerina uh, at the end. I think in some sense it goes back at least to my reading of uh, Asamoahu and Robinson's narrow corridor. Um, you know, we need a state that is capable of resisting the kinds of pressures that Katarina and others have, have pointed to, and that is able to provide the guardrails for the market system uh, and redistribution. So effective regulation that prevents that accumulation of market power uh, that, and I, you know, I had a, an item in a slide, but I didn't mention very much about it, that, that ensures that labor market institutions are there with minimum wages and unions to defend, uh, the, the, defend the, working, the, working, the working people uh, and redistribution. I mean, the, 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 the key on which Saez and Sugman and Piketty hit a lot is true. We, we are able to tax in a much more progressive way. We used to do it. From the 80s, we stopped doing it. If we did it again and used that income to compensate for the losers of globalization and to promote opportunity through both what Hackman calls pre-distribution, right? Investment in the young and redistribution, uh, you know, that would be the way, the way forward. Uh, leave it there. Yeah, I think I, I agree with most of this. Um, the, the, the problem really is the, the, the putting this into a global context. So I think we need we need strong governments at the domestic level, and uh, we have to think hard about institutions that make sure that you have governments that are capable of governing. I mean, we do have to face the fact that we have um, many uh, failing states, of course, in many parts of the world. We also have many very insecure and volatile governments in many parts of the world. And this is going to increase. It's increasing with COVID, with the stress, the political stress from COVID. It's increasing with climate change because that puts a lot of stress on many people. And people have made the connection between climate change and, 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 and failing states and failing governments, particularly in the Middle East already and this will, will be increasing. So it's really, I think we have to think further. It's just, we just won't get stable governments with the old recipes that we've tried in the past. Um, they, fa they face very different challenges. And unfortunately these challenges can be met only if we coordinate globally which is almost impossible with the governments that we currently have in, 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 in place. And if at the same time, we're giving some of the most versatile players an option to just go elsewhere, not even physically, but with their laws, you do your cryptocurrencies in Switzerland and you do your corporations in the Cayman Island and you live in Palo Alto and you move to New Zealand if you cannot deal with the climate change effects. That's not going to give you a polity to address any of these issues. And I think we have to forge new times of polit politics. Don't ask me exactly how, but it's, you know, I think if we had only the domestic, I think, yes, everything is right. If we think about the global challenges, we need more, we need global co coordination, and we need to curtail some of the flexibility that the most versatile players have. Okay, thank you very much. The, the clock is ticking, it's, uh, it's 4.45 right now. Thank you very much. Uh, to you, Katrina. Muito obrigado, Francisco. Muito obrigado, and thank you thank to you. all the participants. And uh, see you next obrigado. time uh, in Lisbon. <laughs>